Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Allison Tolman, member of the program committee and also treasurer of JASA, the Japanese Art Society of America. For those of you who don't know about the society, we were founded in 1973 as the Ukyoe Society of America for the promotion and appreciation of Japanese arts and culture. And we accomplished this through organizing trips to museums and private collections, and also through the publication of our scholarly journal, peer-reviewed Impressions. And I'm really pleased to announce that Impressions just last week won the 2020 American Graphic Design Awards. So congratulations to the Impressions team. During this time of COVID, we're not able to travel to all the exhibitions we'd like. And when I heard that Dr. Kim Motsu was organizing a, a exhibition on Japanese women printmakers from the 1950s, I was really excited, especially because I knew two of them and I had never heard of this collective. But before I introduce Jeannie, let me tell you a little bit about the Portland Art Museum and its connection with Japanese prints, which started back in 1932 when the museum acquired 750 ukiyo-e from Mary Andrews Ladd. Subsequently, Jeannie Kenmotsu's predecessors, Donald Jenkins, with his 45-year tenure at the museum, and Mary Beth Graybill, helped grow the collection. And it's just amazing that as of today, the print collection, the Japanese print collection in Portland numbers over 2,700 traditional and contemporary Japanese prints. So at some point, I hope you will all go there in person and see the wonderful troves that Jini Kenmotsu will be able to show you. Jini Kenmotsu is the Japan Foundation Associate Curator for Japanese Arts and Interim Head of Asian Arts at the Portland Art Museum. In addition, she is a senior fellow of the Mellon Society of Fellows for Critical Bibliography. Jeannie, we're very excited to welcome you to our JASA program series, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. There I am. Thank you for that introduction, Allison. I'm thrilled to be speaking to the Japanese Art Society of America today and to everyone who has tuned in for this JASA event. Before I begin, I want to say a warm thank you to the program committee for the invitation to speak to you all today. Uh, Victoria Melendez, Amy Poster, and most especially Allison Tolman. Allison, as many of you know, has been a dealer and a specialist in modern and contemporary Japanese prints for many years. And ever since she learned about my research on this unusual and fascinating society of artists, she has been uh, an indefatigable ally for my project. I also want to thank Helen Goldenberg, who is working behind the scenes to make sure everything runs smoothly. Today I'll be speaking about an extraordinary group of artists who came together in 1956 to collaborate in organizing group exhibitions of their work. The 1950s and 60s in Japan saw printmaking thrive as an art form. For several decades prior, artists of the Sosaku Hanga or creative print movement had championed the creativity, labor and genius of the individual artists in contrast to traditional Japanese printmaking models. In the post-war period, artists emerging from the Sosaku Hanga movement found an enthusiastic foreign audience for their work, first with American occupation forces and later abroad in biennials and museum shows. But few women were featured in these key exhibitions and publications or in the art societies that provided the critical infrastructure for professional artists. Within this context emerged Japan's first printmaking society for women artists, the Joryu Hanga Kyokai, or the Women's Print Association. This society of artists is the subject of my latest exhibition at the Portland Art Museum. It is called Joryu Hanga Kyokai, 1956 to 1965, Japan's Women Printmakers. 
This is the first new exhibition to open at the Portland Art Museum since our closure due to the coronavirus pandemic in March. It is also the first exhibition anywhere to focus on this pioneering group of women artists, since of course their own self-staged exhibitions in the 50s and 60s. As I think you can begin to see already from the images on your screen, the artists themselves were not united by a shared creative ideology or artistic process. They did not work in a unified mode or aesthetic, nor indeed were they limited to a single printmaking medium. I first became interested in this group while working on a separate project on the artist Yoshida Chizuko, whose work you see here in the lower center. I knew she had been a member of a group called the Joryu Hanga Kyokai, but the group itself is a little bit of a mystery. If you read the standard texts on modern Japanese prints in both English and Japanese, you will see scattered references to this group, but the references are brief to the point of uselessness. They all sort of repeat each other and they answer none of the basic questions. What was this group? Who were the members? How long was it active? In short, this collective, although certainly known at the time, has been largely relegated to a footnote in the larger history of 20th century printmaking in Japan. The Portland Art Museum is home to an exceptionally strong collection of modern prints with more than 280 modern Japanese printmakers represented. The core of that collection was built by the late Gordon Gilkey, who was the museum's first curator of the graphic arts. In 1983, Donald Jenkins, the museum's first curator of Asian art, organized the important exhibition, Images of a Changing World, Japanese Prints of the 20th Century, which included loans, but also drew heavily on the permanent collection. And more recently, recently retired curator of Asian art, Mary Beth Graybill, organized the first survey of the museum's critically significant Japanese print collection as a whole, all the way from the 17th century to the present, uh, as well as a focused and very insightful show looking at five Japanese women printmakers, including two former members of the Joryu Hanga Kyokai. As a result of these groundbreaking efforts by my predecessors, Portland has built a sustained record of engagement with Japan's modern printmaking history. And in fact, despite the exhibitions you see here, none of the works in my current exhibition, with the exception of two, have ever been shown before. So in this respect, I feel very lucky that our holdings of modern Japanese prints are so deep, but I have also been fortunate to work with private collections in New York, Tokyo, and Portland. As I started to piece together the exhibiting history of this society, the picture that began to emerge suggested that even with a rich collection to draw from, the Women's Print Association, Joryu Hanga Kyokai, has to some extent been hiding in plain sight. Other scholars have written in detail on the topic of American and European collectors of Sosaku Hanga during the Allied occupation period immediately following World War II and on into the 1950s, um, including in Jasa's own peer-reviewed journal, Impressions. So I will not rehash that story here. I simply want to point out that English language publications played a significant role in the reception of this work, creating essentially almost a canon of the modern Japanese print, at least for an American audience. The pioneering work was, of course, Oliver Statler's The Modern Japanese Print and Art Reborn that you see here. It was first published in June 1956, a second printing was already out by November of the same year. This is the copy I have. It's um, from the 13th printing in 1976, and there were even more printings after. You can easily find copies of this today. It was without question a huge hit. It shaped the knowledge and tastes of an English speaking audience. Many of you will also recognize this book, which was the project of James Michener, the novelist. Michener was another key figure in all of this. He was a collector himself and had provided early encouragement to Statler. He even wrote the uh, introduction to Statler's book. This one, this book on the right is a deluxe edition that was Michener's own brainchild. It was the result of a two part juried competition between Tokyo and New York City that was held in 1959. The deluxe version you see here is an elephant um, 
uh, oversized limited edition. It came in a wooden slipcase and inside are tipped in original prints by the 10 artists selected along with commentaries by Michener. A popular edition followed in 1968. And again, that book is in libraries everywhere today. Just a further note on these early years, this is an essay by Margaret Gentles from 1959, who was then the curator of Asian art at the Art Institute of Chicago. And in this uh, essay for the museum's bulletin, she's basically repeating in brief all of the general statements made by Statler, really was kind of shaped by his collection and his thoughts. So these kinds of books had an immediate effect on private collecting and institutional display in the United States. This matters in part because I think one of the first surveys of Japanese printmaking, modern Japanese printmaking from a Japanese perspective doesn't appear until 1967, nearly a decade later. For the first Joru Hanga Kyokai exhibition in 1956, this invitation card was printed. By this time, several founding members such as Shishiro Tokuko, Yoshiro Chizuko, Iwami Reika, and Kobayashi Donge were among the few women already admitted to prestigious associations, and they were beginning to show their work regularly in the premier group exhibitions in Japan, such as uh, the annual exhibitions of the Japan Print Association, or the Nihon Hanga Kyokai, which is kind of the, the really big umbrella association that's still active today. Art societies like these have been important for the professional artist in Japan throughout the 20th century. They offered a peer network, but they were also a critical vehicle for exhibition and for publicity. It was a way to be noticed by dealers, collectors, curators, and the public. Despite these gains in the art world of the time, the women you see pictured here have never attained the level of fame of their celebrated male peers, sometimes their own husbands while galleries and the press and collectors reliably supported the careers of male artists, the Joryu Hanga Kyokai Society provided infrastructure and professional support. In other words, it was the crucial vehicle for talented female printmakers to present their own artwork in consistent annual exhibitions over the next decade. Here you see the nine founding members of Joryu Hanga Kyokai. I believe that they are at the opening for the first exhibition on October 22nd, 1956 at Yosero Gallery. From left to right, uh, you see, and I, I will name them, Nishigai Kazuko, Yoshira Chizuko, Hayashi Tomiko. Uh, in the center, looking directly at the camera is Uchima Toshiko. Uh, Kobayashi Donge, then partially obscured is Iwami Reika. Nonaka Yuri, who was the youngest in the group, I think only 18 at the time and Shishiro Tokuko. Not pictured here is Minami Keiko, who was already living in Paris by this time. Over the next decade, the group would grow to encompass at least 25 different printmakers. These artists work in the full range of printmaking methods. Many worked in the techniques of color woodblock printing that were the foundation of the Sosaku Hanga movement. Others specialized in intaglio techniques or lithography, and many of them experimented using new materials or creating monotypes. Their annual exhibitions in Tokyo were the core of their activity together, but they also organized exhibitions of their work in such far-flung places as Osaka, Honolulu, Washington DC, and New York City. The rest of my talk will focus on the five artists who are the primary subject of the current exhibition with a little bit of the remaining time on some additional artists who joined the group over the next 10 years. Iwami Reika is probably the best known of the Joryu Hanga Kyokai artists today. Many of you may recognize her work and I am certain that there are collectors of Iwami's prints tuning in right now. Uh, she is quite beloved by her many fans. You see her here as a young woman in what I believe is the first Joryu Hanga Kyokai exhibition in 1956. At left is a kind of signature piece of her early years. It shows the restricted palette she is known for, usually monochrome with dark reds and touches of mica. It also, also shows one of the themes she would repeatedly turn to over her long career, the sea. 
Iwami's story is also better known than some. She was actually trained as a uh, training as a doll maker, apprenticed to a prestigious master of traditional Japanese doll carving when she discovered woodblock printmaking. Some of her background is actually recounted by James Michener in his book, The Modern Japanese Print. As you will, will recall from a moment ago, this was Michener's big pet project. And it was also an attempt to support and encourage contemporary printmakers. Iwami was one of two women selected for this deluxe book of original prints. You can see her submission here in the center. The other was Shima Tamami, who we will see a little bit later. I brought this book into the show because I think publication really helped make Iwami's career. She was already exhibiting with the Women's Print Association with Joju Hango Kyokai, um, also with the Japan Print Association and others. But this book, especially the popular edition, really elevated her reputation with English speaking audiences and particularly collectors. Again, this is the earlier style she is known for with these deep red tones and textured grays in these uh, semi abstracted landscapes. Her later style is also really recognizable, particularly these textured monochrome compositions that bring out as much character of the wood grain as possible. And like here, she uses gold and silver foil to create these bright luminous highlights. I think you can see why Iwami is such a popular printmaker. I was very sad to hear of her passing in March of this year at the age of 93. But it's unquestionable that she had an incredibly long and productive career. I think it's worth pointing out that unlike many of the group's founders, Iwami never married or had children. And she had the early support of one of the biggest ambassadors for Japanese prints, James Michener. Now this print was made in 1964 when she was still exhibiting with Joju Hanga Kyokai. But already in 1964, she has hit on the overall aesthetic that she would pursue for decades. So I think that speaks to a real clarity in her artistic practice, something that she's achieved basically in the first decade of printmaking. But one of the most surprising and wonderful events while working on this exhibition has been the discovery of an Iwami print, unlike any I'd seen before, which you see here on the left. The print is undated, but I believe it is one of her earliest prints. I have dated it to the 1950s based on the materials uh, also in the style of these curving, abstracted, uh, serif-like shapes, the palette of deep red and warm, dark yellow, uh, and also based on comparison to some of her very earliest prints, which are quite rare. Putting this print in relationship with both her work of the late 50s and early 60s, which you see on the top row, and the later phase from about the mid 60s onward, these are all prints in the exhibition. I really feel as though I've been able to understand the whole of her practice and of her career that much better. So that as an art historian has been exciting. And as a curator to be able to represent that range in just a few prints for our audiences has been really rewarding. I tend to think of Yoshida Chizuko as one of the ringleaders of the women prints Printmakers Association. Uh, Yoshida was one of the most well-connected and in some ways most established of the Joryu Hanga Kyokai artists. She married into the well-known Yoshida family of artists, headed then by Yoshida Hiroshi, the great printmaker of the early 20th century. Hiroshi's sons Toshi and Horaka had followed in his footsteps, and their mother Fujio was also a painter and printmaker. So prints were truly the family business. Chizuko had been a painter and did not begin making prints until after her marriage to Horaka. But once she started making prints, she really never looked back. The print on the right is named after Jama Masjid in Delhi, one of the largest mosques in India, which she would have seen while on her honeymoon. She and Horaka embarked on a kind of working honeymoon in 1957, traveling all around the world for a year. So this work is very typical of her, her, her prints during the years that Joryu Hango Kyokai was exhibiting together with this really strong graphic sense and bold colors, which you can also see a little bit, I think, in the prints that she's handling in her studio here, 
uh, on the left. This photograph provides a really interesting image. It comes from a new printmaking journal or magazine that was begun in the early 1970s. The story was basically a photo essay of Jodu Hongo Kyokai members. And I, I have to believe that they were happy to have the press coverage, but it is still very much a product of its time. At one point, the writer calls them Mamasan Hangaka, so mommy printmakers. And that description is so at odds with the kind of self presentation I see here with Yoshida Chizuko who has posed herself working in her studio. Um, although she did indeed have a family with small children to care for, like many of these women. I think it's important to remember that this kind of language and framing was yet another challenge that they faced as artists. These are two early prints by Yoshida Chizuko. They are fairly typical of many of her earliest prints, small in size, full of energy and movement, and although the colors are perhaps a little less bold here than what we just saw, there's still this sense of exuberance, even in the use of color contrasts. Her early background was in dance and music, and this print titled Rainy Day is partly a visualization of the sound of rain falling. Many of her prints from this period were about music. In this photograph, you can see one of her, of her other early prints, Mambo, in the background from 1956, which was also inspired by music. What I like about these prints is how they show she's clearly working toward that same kind of abstraction two years earlier, but she hasn't quite yet pared down her compositions as she would soon begin to do, just as we saw with uh, Jamal Masji. Like Iwami Reka, Yoshida would go on to make prints for decades. These prints were produced just after Joryu Hanga Kyokai's life as an organization, but they indicate some of the range and the changes in Yoshida's practice. I also, quite frankly, included them because they are so striking and they seem to really have that forceful impact that has practically sort of stopped people in their tracks in the gallery. They're photographed here in raking light. Uh, so you can see the deep patterns created by blind embossing in the paper. There is certainly a little bit of op art and minimalist influence she is exploring here, but there is still a sense of a referent. Um, the work on the right is a landscape. It's called Landscape in Blue. Yoshida would soon shift away from this really pared down type of composition, but it does anticipate some of the work she would go on to do in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Uchima Toshiko, one of the collective's founding members, is one of the least well-known today. In the early 1950s, she began exhibiting her paintings with avant-garde groups like the Democratic Artists Association. In 1954, she married Uchima Anse, and like Yoshira Chizuko and her husband, the couple maintained a lot of connections in the world of contemporary printmakers. And I think she too might have had a leadership role in the Joryu Hanga Kyokai. Her husband Anse had worked closely with Oliver Statler when he was interviewing print, uh, artists for his book on Sosaku Hanga. Although she remained a member of the Women's Print Association for the group's entire run, in 1959, they moved together to the United States where Anse had been born. They settled in New York City where she supported her husband's successful career as a practicing artist and teacher at Sarah Lawrence College and Columbia University. Here you see her with one of her prints that is in the current exhibition titled Fantasy. One of the things evident in Uchima's work are certain aspects of the creative print movement with its emphasis on expressing the interiority of the artist. There is an undeniable strength to many of her prints and maybe also a kind of vivid psychological force. This comes through not only in her titles, but also her palette and the kinds of forceful marks she must have made on the block with her carving tools, as well as uh, it's an issue of scale. These are among the largest works in the exhibition. Solitude, which you see on the left, which was shown in the group's first exhibition in 1956, is more than three feet high. It's enormous. In person, these works are really impressive. 
uh, Wind on the right, must have caught the eye of the Japan Times art critic when she visited the group's fourth annual show. You see here uh, illustrated in the newspaper uh, clipping uh, from the period uh, where it's um, illustrating the review. Yet then there are prints like Bridge from 1965, which is so different in its mood and its subtlety. This print likely takes inspiration from the George Washington Bridge, which could be seen from the windows of the family's apartment in Manhattan. Uchima Toshiko is, um, for me, one of the hardest artists of the Jodu Hanga Kyokai to categorize. And I think that has to do with the fact that her printmaking lasted only a very short time. When the Uchimas moved to the United States, Toshiko continued to send prints to the annual shows, and she stayed a really active participant in the group but she made few prints after the family's immigration. Her son, Anju Uchima, who has lent so generously to this show, has recalled that although his father's studio was right there in the home, he couldn't remember his mother ever entering the studio except to clean it. Perhaps to forge a path distinct from that of her husband, uh, Uchima left printmaking behind in 1966, turning instead to a practice of collage and assemblage. Had she continued making prints, I do wonder how her work might have developed. Minami Keiko was the oldest of the founding members of Jōryū Hanga Kyokai, and a bit unusual in that she lived abroad in France for much of her career. She moved to Tokyo from Toyama Prefecture at age 35 in 1946, after the end of the war. Minami had been interested in poetry and painting she, since she had been a child, and upon moving to Tokyo had originally hoped to become an illustrator of children's literature. I think you can still see elements of that early interest in her etchings like those you see here. Her touches on the plate are very fine. Her colors tend to be understated. And there's that little bit of deliberate naivete in her draftsmanship that you often see in children's books. The settings are sometimes fairy tale like with castles and towers. And I think what she's especially good at is creating a scene that implies narrative. The viewer is almost looking for a story to complete the picture. They are, they are also quite charming and somehow sort of sweet without being cloying or saccharine. Minami began etching after meeting the artist Hamaguchi Yozo, whom she would later marry. In 1954, she moved with Hamaguchi to Paris, where they would remain for nearly three decades. Her prints have been popular since almost the moment she had uh, began creating them. In 1956, the city of Paris acquired one of her works. Uh, and within two years, both the Museum of Modern Art in New York and UNICEF were reproducing her prints for greeting cards. Minami's prints are often described as delicate or whimsical, but I've wondered about the kind of gendering nature of those terms and if we would use them if she had been a male artist. The more I look at her work, the more the sparseness and the absences of her prints stand out to me. There is also, I think, an eerie quality to the empty spaces of her prints and to her drawing style. Um, it's almost a little bit of an element of what we see in an illustrator like, I don't know, Edward Gorey. Um, it's very different in kind, of course, but an alternate reading of her work might recognize that there is also something eerie and maybe even a little bit unsettling in her prints. Another underappreciated aspect of her work, I think, is her design sense. A few of her prints, such as these, hint at other directions she might have taken. This is just speculation, of course, but like Uchiman Yoshida, Minami was married to a fellow artist, one whose career eclipsed her own and whom she would have supported in a thousand ways at home. I'm certain that their life in France offered greater freedoms than Japan of the 1950s and 60s. Nevertheless, these prints suggest some alternative directions in design and ab abstraction uh, that I think remain unexplored. Kobayashi Donge's story is also that of an artist shaped by her time. 
1945, she wanted to study at the Tokyo School of Fine Arts, what we know today as Geidai for short. But at that time, only men were accepted to the prestigious art university. So instead, she enrolled at Joshibi Women's University of Art and Design, where she studied in the Western Painting Department. This is a pretty common feature of the biographies of a lot of the women artists of this generation in Japan. Bunka Gakuin was another art school where a number of women studied, I should say where they were allowed to study and take classes. Kobayashi pictured here with a printing press in the background began engraving only in 1951 when she joined a study group at the home of artist Sekino Junichiro. One of the things that I think is kind of lost when we are thinking about printmaking in the early 1950s is the actual difficulty of acquiring the necessary equipment. Not only did she need access to a press, but in the beginning, Kobayashi apparently had trouble getting her own tools. So buying a burin, the basic tool of the engraver, whether for reasons of scarcity or gender or both, I don't know. But she clearly had an affinity for the medium. She produced surreal, dreamlike prints with a lot of tonal range. She coaxes out these velvety backgrounds, uh, really knows how to utilize the white of the paper. Early in her career, Kobayashi developed a distinct vocabulary. Femme fatales and inscrutable female figures were common. She drew equally from her own imagination and from famous works of literature and mythology. This print on the right takes up the subject from uh, the Greek myth of Zeus uh, disguised as a swan in order to seduce his chosen paramour, Leda. Other subjects were inspired by the poet Sappho. There is an entire series dedicated to the story of Salome. But Kobayashi also took up Japanese literature. The print on the left comes from a portfolio illustrating the celebrated Japanese work Tales of Moonlight and Rain, or Ugetsu Monogatari. The title of this print, Asaji Gayado, or House Amid the Reeds, refers to the story of a husband who returns home to a house choked by reeds due to neglect. He had deserted his faithful wife only to find out that she had become a ghost while waiting for him. Kobayashi was an artist with a distinct point of view and her depictions of seductive femme fatales and symbolist influenced fantasies seemed to perturb exhibition reviewers and writers in the period. And I've noticed uh, the occasional male viewer today. From what I have learned about Kobayashi and her biography, I do get the sense that she was known for something of a strong personality, which certainly in the 50s would have been remarked on in a Japanese woman. I know that she had a young son when she went to France alone in 1964, where she stayed for about a year and a half. While in Paris, she spent time with Minami Keiko and Hamaguchi Yozo, who probably introduced her to a lot of people. I know that she spent time working in Johnny Friedlander's studio, for example. She also talked about going to see art constantly while she was in France. And she has this great quote where she says that she liked William Blake and Alfred Beardsley. And you can certainly see that in her work, but she hated Cezanne. Um, she also, I think, had a real penchant for symbolist artists. Uh, the Marsh Flower or Numa no Hana is a title she gave to quite a few different prints. For this version, though, when I saw this print, I thought she must have been looking at Odilon Redon, and indeed that she must have seen this particular print, the Marsh Flower, a sad human head. Shima Tamami joined the Joryu Hanga Kyokai in 1959 and contributed works to their fourth exhibition. As I mentioned earlier, she was one of only two women artists selected for Michener's deluxe limited edition book celebrating the modern Japanese print. Her signature subject is birds, so this is a fitting example of her work for Michener to have included. She was another artist like Iwami who tended to search out uh, wood blocks where the grain of the wood was especially pronounced and it could be beautifully enhanced with tonal printing. 
This is a quality that I think would have especially appeared to, to Michener and to the American collectors he helped to cultivate because it made visible a tangible connection to the materials of traditional Japanese woodblock printing. On the right, you see the invitation card to the fourth exhibition. It was designed by Yoshida Hodaka, Chizuko's husband. By this time, the group had moved to holding their exhibitions at the seventh floor gallery of the Toyoko department store in Shibuya. The quote at lower right on the card, which expresses anticipation for the exhibition, was provided by the poet and art critic Takiguchi Shuzo, who by this time was also well established as an artist and kind of known as something of a, uh, of a mentor to a number of avant-garde um, young artists. Having the figure of Takiguchi's stature indicates something of their seriousness of purpose. This was not just mama-san printmakers indulging their hobby. The group's membership was fluid, but it steadily expanded over the decade. Enokiro Maki was a slightly younger artist who joined the Joryu Hanga Kyokai in 1963. <clears throat> Enokiro had graduated from Bunka Gakuin a few years prior, and already she had won prizes in exhibitions with the Japan Print Association. At left and right are works from her early series titled Efflorescence. In Japanese, this title, Kaika, can also be translated as blooming. And indeed, these are usually understood as sunflowers blossoming. The detail here shows you the yellow center, which indeed looks just like a sunflower's seeds. But I would also argue there is a larger interest in her early work in bio biomorphic forms, uh, as you can see in the vertical efflorescence print on the left and the untitled monochrome print at center. The swirling psychedelic color can be a little bit of a distraction from these really fine lines she has drawn with an etching needle. Um, these also put me in mind of artifacts from the fossil record, kind of like the spiral shell of an ammonite. And of course, there were many more artists. Here you see more works from the Portland Art Museum collection. Takahashi Junko, who worked in etching, and Motoyama Michiko and Tochigi Junko, uh, who both worked with woodblock using bright planes of color. So if you didn't believe me in the beginning that the Joryu Hanga Kyokai represented a very diverse body of work, I hope I have made my case. As I mentioned at the beginning, this was a group that came together as professionals, a society that provided an essential means for talented female printmakers to present their work. You can see an installation photograph here of the seventh exhibition in 1962. And at right, I'm not yet sure exactly which year this was, but this is also from one of their exhibitions with the artists seated around a table, relaxed, smiling. I do think that there was a genuine sense of camaraderie and mutual support that would have suffused and likely sustained their efforts. I know that a number of the artists maintained friendships for decades after the group stopped exhibiting together. Uchima Toshiko in New York City kept up a regular correspondence with um, people like Iwami Reka, who you see in the center, and Moriyasu in the polka dotted dress, uh, smiling. Yoshida Chizuko stayed in touch with others as well. In closing, you may have wondered what on earth I am doing to have opened an exhibition during a pandemic. And I had the same thought myself a few times. But this exhibition's warm reception by visitors to our galleries and the national and even international interest it has garnered have reinforced to me just how needed these kinds of stories are. The exhibition at the Portland Art Museum is the first of its kind, but I hope it is not the last. I hope that future scholars, collectors, Lovers of Japanese art and of 20th century printmaking will pursue further research on this remarkable group of artists. For my part, I am working on an essay of the Joryu Hanga Kyokai as a collective. And in the meanwhile, we are developing a virtual version of the exhibition, knowing that many of you will not have the opportunity to travel to Portland to see the exhibition in person. So please stay tuned for that as part two. For now, I hope that today's presentation has piqued your interest in the artists of the Joryu Hanga Kyokai 
and that bringing you this piece of lost history has helped reframe or expand how you conceive of the story of the modern Japanese print. Thank you. Jeannie, thank you so much. To me, since I knew a few of the artists, it was really wonderful to go cycle back through their work and see <laughs> what kind of a show could be made, but also to discover who the Jodu Hanga Kyokai were. Do we have any idea why the, why the collective disbanded? That's a great question. One I would love to be able to answer. Um, as you and I have, have spoken about, um, there, there are really no records, of course, um, and I would, how I would love to ask them. Mm -hmm. um, so no, we don't know. I think I, I can speculate a little bit. Um, there are, I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted by all of the questions coming in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can spec. I mean, there are a number of reasons I can. I think I could speculate. I mean, one, of course, is family demands. Many, if not most, of the women were married. Um, Shima Tamami, who I, I showed the bird print of, she, um, I know, was married to a print artist. They moved to uh, the Southeast United States. She had, she had sons. Um, this was true for for many of them. In addition, I think you know the the need for the society may have, you know, they may have been so successful, they sort of obviated the need for themselves um, in that they, I think that they were fairly effective in, in becoming better known. And so maybe, you know, I think it was partly an entree to some of the larger and more prestigious societies like the Japan Print Association. Um, there was a lot of money pumped into uh, Sosaku Hanga in general. Uh, and Japanese printmaking and their sort of export abroad, particularly in the United States. And uh, they did participate in some of those. And that leads me, I mean, we, now, now I'm going to feed you some questions before our time is up. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have asked if the women had their own presses, did they do their own printing work or did they work in a studio? Did they meet for critiques and to share information as women printmakers or did they primarily show together and not, they didn't work together, but just exhibited together? I'll take the last part uh, first. I think there's a, a mix of those. Um, I think there, you know, there's a sense that they got together to do some of the administrative planning and sort of things, um, but because they're not a collective brought together by sort of a shared vision, um, I think there was less of what we we sort of think of when we think of an artist group or a movement of kind of the the um, the convivial salon type of uh, an image. Um, I think, I think it tended to be more exhibiting together, but certainly, I mean, they, they had their children with them, uh, you know, at their exhibitions and, uh, you know, they would have, you know, a meal together clearly in one of their homes. Um, so certainly they spent some time together in those respects. As for doing their own printing, again, a mix. Um, uh, those who worked in copper plate of etching and engraving, um, I think almost universally did not have their own press. They would have needed to uh, borrow studio time. Quite a few of them went to France actually uh, and worked either in uh, Atelier 17 or worked with Johnny Friedlander. Um, but I, and then they came back and I, so I don't know where they were able to get access uh, after that, but I'm sure they used a shared studio. Those who were doing um, woodcut or woodblock printing um, often we're doing their own printing. They often incorporate other materials. Usually they're using plywood blocks, but they might um, use string or other kinds of things. And because of the way that that system works, you don't need a press, you can do it with your, um, with your own body weight. <laughs> um, could you place these women's work in the historical context? This is a two-part question from two different people, which I'm going to put together. For example, how did they relate to prints made by men at the same time in Japan? And then Catherine Gauvier asks if any of these artists were influenced by women artists of Japan from earlier periods, for example, Katsushika Oe. Or Oe. Tell me the first question again, I didn't catch it. Oh, so it was whether um, there, were, there were any, um, <laughs> I, there are so many questions, everybody. This is very exciting. So I'm trying to <laughs> get it I'll all. I'll take the second question about whether they were looking at other women artists like uh, like 
Hokusai's daughter puts Shikoi. Yes. Uh, no, I mean, there's no evidence that they were looking to um, to earlier Japanese ukiyo-e artists or earlier Japanese female artists. And what about men, male artists at the time? Uh, of earlier artists or, I mean- No, they're, they're contemporary. The... Zoom. Sorry, I, I missed that, Allison. Oh, I just was wondering if they were, how, what was the connection with male artists who were working, their, their contemporaries at that time? Oh, contemporaries. Oh, absolutely. I think there was quite a bit of exchange with um, fellow artists. I mean, there are quite a, a few uh, two-person shows with husband and wife. I mean, that's a kind of nice package, I think. Um, and, so, and in some cases, like the, the Yoshidas, for instance, Hodaka and Chizuko, I think, did play off of one another. They, not only in terms of um, the kinds of images they were producing, but even techniques. I forget who's first, I think it was Hodaka, but um, one of them begins using later on zinc plates, uh, incorporating that with the, a lot of the woodblock printing that they had been doing earlier. And then the other one picks it up. I mean, there's, there's certainly exchange within a studio at home like that, but also with their peers as well. And, and that's, I think, pretty easy to see even just visually. Um, aside from Takiguchi, did they have any allies in the world of art criticism? What kind of art periodicals, if at all, covered their exhibitions? That's a great question. I think for the most part, it was really, um, they did get reviews in the English language newspapers. I haven't been able to find any reviews in Japanese language newspapers, although I, that doesn't mean that there weren't any. Um, but it's, it'll often be like a sort of a one and done review. And what's interesting is um, Oliver Statler reviewed uh, their first show. Elise Grilly was a, a critic for the Japan Times. Um, you know, the, it reads like criticism of the period. It doesn't, you know, it's not quite, Takiguchi Shuzo's quote, he really sort of takes them seriously. Um, which is not to say that Oliver Statler wasn't, but he speaks about them the same way Mitchner does, which is to say, there's so much discussion of the fact that they're women of femininity in their work and whether they, he is seeing that femininity or he is not. Um, and even Elise Grilly, who's a, a, a female art critic for the Japan Times, um, this, it's, it's kind of this wonderful, um, uh, capsule of the moment because she works really hard not to talk about um, their femininity, but in doing so, she just keeps talking about how she's not going to center the fact that they're women. And so the whole article ends up kind of being about that rather than really being about kind of serious um, uh, critique and examination of their work. What was the name of the print publication that featured the Yoshida Chizuko photo essay that you mentioned before? Uh, when you were talking about the Mm -hmm. It's Purinto Ato, so print art. I think it begins in 1971 and it runs, they had quite a few issues, which also I think tells you something about the kind of upswell of interest and uh, in printmaking in Japan and the support for it and the market for it. One of the things, another, this is a little bit to the side, but one of the things I had to cut from my talk was a little bit more of a discussion of the gallery system. I think it's really important to note that the um, Yoseido Gallery, which is the first uh, gallery to be devoted to contemporary uh, prints, mm -hmm. um, isn't established until 1953. And that's a whole other sort of topic to sort of see how someone like Abe Yuji, the owner of that, uh, founder of that gallery, sort of weaves in and out of these associations, helps to start these exhibitions, some of which are still going today, like the CWAJ uh, uh, exhibitions, the College Women's Art, uh, College Women's Association of Japan. So um, there's this kind of upswell that clearly is happening through the beginning in the 50s, through the 60s, and certainly by the early 70s. So that's where Printato comes from. This is a bit of a technical question, and I'm not, I'm not sure that uh, you, you will know, but uh, Johnny Plastini would like to know if any of these artists work with the Shin Kole technique in their intaglio or relief work. I'm interested in the Western versus non-Western relationship of the Shinkole process. Hmm, I think I'd have to look at some more of um, um, more of their work. I think yes, with uh, those who are working in relief, mm -hmm. 
Not so much though. Any, I can't think of anyone that's doing that really who is working in intaglio techniques. Maybe I would say just looking at the prints that you showed, I didn't see any Shinkole work. Um, I don't know if that's just because I'm looking at it through the screen, but. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a flattening effect, but no, I mean, I think there's a little bit of experimentation with certain artists who I, I haven't really shown, um, but only with relief. How did, how did the artist's reception outside of Japan influence the reception that they had within the country? I think this is, this is I think someone should write a PhD dissertation on this, <laughs> make it a real proper study. Um, I think enormously, uh, and I'm, not, I'm certainly not the first to, to say that. There are a lot of folks who have looked at this. There are specialists um, who have really thought about this moment. Um, uh, including a really great impressions article. I recommend everyone get their impressions copies. Um, I think it had all the effect in the world. It, you know, Michener's project and Statler to some extent too. I mean, part of their work in doing these publications um, and partnering with Tuttle was to kind of proselytize the Japanese print um, to audiences who could afford them. And in doing so, it helped to create a market, I think, back home. I mean, I, you know, arguably there's still an even bigger market in the United States for modern Japanese prints than in Japan. Um, but I, I, think, I think we can't overstate how important that was. Now, the exact contours of how that worked, um, what that meant for different generations of artists, it was very different for someone like Onchi Koshiro than it was for um, someone like Kobayashi Donge working in uh, Intaglio, for instance, and so not Sosaku Hanga as we uh, describe it today. Um, but absolutely, I think there was a, an, an enormous impact. Um, Alicia Voke, thanks you for your talk and wanted to know if you had learned of any relationship between this group and the Joryu Gaka Kyokai. That is a good question. I think there is one artist, I'd have to look at the bios I've written up for them. I think there may be one artist who by the 10th exhibition in 1965 was also a member or had been a member of Joryu Gaka, but I, I, mean, I may be making that up, but if I'm not, it's really, I mean, it's, it's slim. It's just the one. And Andrew Maskey would, says, so many of the artists lived very long lives. Did any of them that you know of receive any formal recognition in Japan for their artistic accomplishments in their old age? Oh, in their older age? Yeah. Oh gosh, I haven't thought, of, I haven't really looked at that. Um, I'm not sure about in their older age. Um, certainly they were, they started to win prizes. I mean, some of them won prizes pretty early on, but um, you know, they were winning prizes at home in the, the big exhibitions. Um, I don't know, Allison, do you know if Iwami received particular recognition? I don't think so. And in fact, I, I would have to say that although so many of these women, not all of them went on even after the disbandment of the Joryu Hanga Kyokai, they kept on working and they kept on making prints and they exhibited and they were collected by museums and by you know private collectors. I don't know if they ever achieved, you know, if they if they received any recognition, any any formal recognition. Recognition. Certainly, um, the collective didn't. I mean, I can I can say that for yeah. sure. Um, but there may have been certain artists who. I don't know though. I I don't think so. I will say Kobayashi Donge um, uh, just had a recent retrospective um, at the Sakura City Art Museum. I think she's actually had two in the, there in the last ten years. Um, and she is one of the few artists who's still living. Um, I, I mean, I think she's she's pretty she's quite advanced in age, and so you know I don't think she could actually even go to her own exhibition. But um, there, you know, I think there's some recognition in that sense, but not formally. I think, as um, his question suggests, these are great. Ro questions. Rosina Buckland would like to know if their works were collected by Japanese art museums at the time. Oh, Rosina. Uh, good question. I know that there are now. Um, the National Museum of Modern Art in Osaka has quite a few. They have pretty good representation. And then there's a scattering um, among the other national museums. And of course, also with some of the 
local and regional museums. That, of course, is part of their mandate for some of those prefectural art museums. But whether they were collecting them in the period, I would wager to say no, but I, I, I just don't know. Um, we, we have a question from somebody who says that you'd mentioned, you know, that women were not, what wants to know if were women excluded or just not welcome to the male dominated print groups and societies? I guess because they made their own collective. Well, I will say, I mean, they weren't wholesale excluded, but I think if you look at, um, you know, Yoshida Chizuko was admitted to the Japan Print Association, uh, Nihon Hanka Kyokai, which has this long history. It goes arguably all the way back to 1918. In 1931, it becomes Joryu Hanga Kyokai, sort of bringing a couple of groups together. And that's kind of what we know it as today. In 1954, Yoshida Chizuko was, uh, became a member. Um, also Shishiro Tokuko. And then the next year, I think it was Iwami Reika and uh, Kobayashi Donge. And then the next, you know, so you sort of see this really slow creep, but it's interesting. I mean, this is happening right as uh, this group has gotten together. So that, I mean, that's one of the reasons it's a sort of um, circumstantial evidence, I think. But it's one of the reasons why I think some of their impact on their own careers wasn't necessarily that this group and this collective in and of itself became famous and well known and uh, well celebrated, but that it helped get their names out there and it sort of increased recognition um, so that they could have a little bit more entree to some of these more prestigious societies. Two, we have time for two more questions before we bid farewell. Uh, Julie Davis would like to know, what about their dealers or did they mainly sell from shows that they had organized? I think they did sell mainly from shows. Now they, now they did I mean, have dealers. Um, several of them participated in Yoseido gallery shows, you know, but it would be a list of Yoseido, you know, if you look at the price lists or the, you know, the, those early catalogs, it'll be 20 artists and maybe one of them is a woman, maybe four of them are women um, and they each have one or two uh, prints. They, um, I think they also sold uh, some of their works themselves probably to collectors who they formed relationships with. And interestingly, you know, Munakata and Hiratsuka, uh, Munakata Shiko and uh, Hiratsuka Unichi both had galleries in the United States. And I think most of the buying in the late fifties and early sixties was American and uh, at least in terms of any kind of actual income. And, and I know that they uh, had one exhibition as Joryu Hanka Kyokai uh, in, in DC at the Hiratsuka Gallery. So I don't know exactly what the dealing relationship was there, um, but I know that they were selling through him. Okay, one, one final question, which is, what do you personally take away? What were your personal takeaway from their work and their life? Cool. Such a big question. Um, well, to be really, really honest, find you know, there's something about working from home that makes you just fully candid. I think one of the things that's really interesting is, um, you know, the, the sounds a little trite, but, you know, perseverance, I think, is one of the personal lessons I take away. Um, as people mentioned, you know, these women kept creating work for decades. And some like Iwami had, I think, really commercially successful careers, but Yoshida Chizuko kept making prints. And I don't think she was, you know, she wasn't making a lot of money. She wasn't making a living from it. Um, I think that's, that's one of the things is that you can continue to be really creative and sort of, you know, whether the commercial art market is, is supporting you or not. Um, but again, I really, I do view this exhibition as kind of an introduction. I view it as a little bit of an intervention in sort of what we know, but I also really think of it as an invitation. And I really hope that um, others will take up these artists and run with them. And we will learn more about their lives, about their careers, about their uh, practices, because I think there is so much more to still be uncovered. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. And we hope that you'll join us next month on December 16th, 
when Dr. John Carpenter, the Mary Griggs Burke Curator of Japanese Art at the Metropolitan Museum, will be talking on quelling demons and disease in Japanese art. Thank you very much and good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone.